This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. The Carsey Wolf Center is a vibrant center of interdisciplinary research and teaching and public programming. Uh, it brings together faculty and students and industry professionals and policy experts and the public to discuss a, a wide variety of compelling topics such as environmental media, media ownership, the history of film, the history of television, the future of new media, and the social effects of media in all of its forms. And last year, we began our inaugural series of academic and public programs to commemorate the opening of the Pollock Theater and the wonderful new facilities of the Carsey Wolf Center with a retrospective on law and order. And it's fitting today, uh, partly in homage to the other side of the hyphen of the Carsey Wolf Center, that we focus on the art and impact of television comedy. And I'm very grateful to uh, Marcy Carsey and Dick Wolf and all of the Carsey Wolf uh, Center advisory board members, uh, in particular those who have helped sponsor uh, this conference. And I'd also like to thank uh, the organizers and the co-directors, Constance Penley and Ron Rice and executive director Richard Hutton. Now since I am a professor of English and comparative literature as well as a dean, um, I did, I confess, in anticipation of this conference, look in the Oxford English Dictionary to find the first use of the phrase situation comedy. It appears in 1953, according to the OED, in TV Guide. The sentence is, ever since I Love Lucy zoomed to the top rung on the rating ladder, it seems the networks have been filling every available half hour with another situation comedy. Now I know that this conference is using the phrase scripted comedy, uh, and the program indicates that it has its origins really in radio, but of course to talk about scripted comedy, one has to go back to the origins in the stage comedies of Moliere and Sheridan and Fielding and Marivaux and go back even further to the classical uh, theater. Uh, but it's not a coincidence that 17th and 18th century stage comedies often focus on a family uh, and various domestic scenes, domestic dilemmas related to love and marriage uh, and, and money. Scholars, by the way, have tried to reconstruct the missing book two of Aristotle's Poetics in which he gave his theory of comedy. Uh, in the Poetics, he talks about tragedy and epic, but not too much about comedy. Uh, there are some fragments that remain that actually are, are pretty interesting. Uh, Aristotle says that the difference between comedy and tragedy is that tragedy aims to represent people as better than they actually are, and comedy aims to represent people as worse than they actually are. And I wonder if today we've reversed that uh, uh, distinction. I was tempted to read to you Aristotle's list of all the different elements uh, of his anatomy of comedy, but I think I'd have to take out my laugh track uh, if I were to do so. Uh, and indeed, it occurred to me that the most compelling uh, list that I know of, um, that many of the writers probably are familiar with, uh, is to be found in James Agee's famous anatomy of what he called the main grades of the laugh in the language of screen comedians. And there's a famous essay in which one of the first film critics uh, uh, published uh, this, uh, James Agee wrote in, actually it was published in Life in, in 1949, and he said, in the language of screen comedians, four of the main grades of laugh are the titter, the yowl, the belly laugh, and the boffo. 
The titter is just a titter. The yowl is a runaway titter. Anyone who has ever had the pleasure knows all about a belly laugh. The baffo is the laugh that kills. And he goes on to describe this very complicated, perfect gag, perfectly constructed and played that brings the victim up a ladder of laughs. And that's a really wonderful uh, description. In fact, this isn't really so far from Aristotle's insight that comedy through pleasure and laughter achieves the purgation of the like emotions. And Aristotle has a wonderful sentence where he says that comedy has laughter, so to speak, for its mother. So that's something to think about in the discussions today. Well, the conference, of course, is about more than laughter. It's also about the persistence of the genre of the TV comedy and the remarkable impact that it has had on society, on social mores, and on our sense of the possibilities of our own lives and the lives of people around us. And in that sense, comedy, including television comedy, helps to change our sense of the world that we live in. So I'm delighted to welcome the conference participants, including scholars of television and media studies, journalists, some of the writers, producers, directors, actors, and industry professionals who have kept TV comedy a vibrant and socially important form of entertainment today. So I hope you have a good day, and I welcome you to the campus. Thank you. And now I'll introduce you to Christina Venegas, the Chair of Film and Media Studies. I am not here to be funny. If you know me, you know I've been working very, very hard most of my life, do you know, to get rid of the accent. It's not working. Seriously, though. I want to add my welcome to all those of you um, to the Pollock Theater and to our campus uh, from the Film and Media Studies Department, where I have the privilege to work with a stunning group of colleagues, students, and staff who contribute so much to our department and also to public programs like these. Um, one of our goals in the department in addition to teaching a wide array of topics in film international cinema, um, television studies from telegraphy to the digital, um, comedy we already have in our curriculum, is to expand, um, in fact, the television studies curriculum and programs such as these, as this one and the one that David mentioned earlier, um, the retrospective on law and order that we had last year, contribute um, to uh, broadening not only the conversation in our curriculum, but also um, including a broader participant, set of participants. And I would really here, I'm, I'm just here today to thank everyone who has worked so hard um, in putting this together, and especially thank those of you who have contributed um, to making this program happen. Our extraordinary faculty members, especially Jennifer Holt, Lisa Parks, Anna Everett, and Constance Penley. Our amazing staff in the Film and Media Studies Department, Kathy Murray, Joe Palladino, Matt Ryan, uh, Dana Welch, Keith Boynton, and Flora Furlong. They're all hovering around in various parts of the day. And our talented graduate students, Ethan Tussie, Rachel Allen, Lindsay Palmer, Carlos Jimenez, um, and Sarita Hinojos, um, who we borrow from Chicano Studies. Um, and the wonderful staff of the Carsey Wolf Center, Leanne French, Kevin Sanson, Natalie Fawcett, and the many, many student volunteers that you see around here. Um, and I would also like to thank and introduce Richard Hutton, who is the executive director of the Carsey Wolf Center. Enjoy the day. Thank you, Christina. Um, uh, I, I, as Christina noted, I'm Richard Hutton, executive director of the Carsey Wolf Center, and along with my co-directors, Constance Penley and Ron Rice, I'm thrilled to welcome you to the Pollock Theater for this day-long conference. For those of you who haven't been here before, the Pollock is a wonderful resource for UC Santa Barbara and the community. It offers a state-of-the-art cinematic experience available nowhere else in our area. It's part of the Carsey Wolf Center, which supports research, teaching, and public programming about media, cultivating the creativity, critical skills, 
and new forms of literacy that students and the public need in the 21st century. Events like this one require contributions and amazing dedication from a huge group of people. So even though it's a little repetitious, I'd really like to thank them before we start. I'd like to express my own gratitude to three people who are deeply involved in helping us think through today's event. Our advisory board event subcommittee, Marcy Carsey, Rick Rosen, and Gary Newman. I'd also like to thank, I'd also like to thank Rick Rosen and Dick Wolf for their support uh, in underwriting to underwrite the programming in the Pollock Theater, and it's their support that has made possible this event today. Finally, I'd like to offer my deep appreciation to the Pollock Theater and Carsey Wolf Center interns and the staffs of Film and Media Studies and the Carsey Wolf Center for everything they've done to prepare for this day. They're listed in the back of your program, and if you run into one and see that name, please, and if you're enjoying the program, please don't hesitate to let them know. So, why put on a day-long conference focusing on a television genre that every decade or so is the subject of a flood of obituaries? Well, as Mark Twain said after the New York Journal had published his obituary, the reports of my death are great, greatly exaggerated. The scripted comedy has been a staple of media, first radio, then television, for 70 years. And why should it ever die? It's a genre with a huge array of possible stories and possible characters from the comfort food of slightly skewed families and coworkers in offices, bars, and radio stations, to the, um, to the edgiest of dirt bags, smart Alex, and, uh, can't read that, misfits. From our very own, very familiar neighbors, the Huxtables and the Nelsons, to the Solomons, the aliens from Third Rock from the Sun. In fact, Jane Feuer, one of the panelists of our first session, has pointed out that it might be this very ideological flexibility that has accounted for the sitcom's longevity. As Jane recently wrote, the sitcom has been the perfect format for illustrating current ideological conflicts while entertaining an audience. What if, for example, a family of hillbillies struck oil and moved to the richest community in the USA? What if a working class bigot father had to live with a leftist son-in-law? What if a family of liberals gave birth to a Republican son? What if the daughter of aging hippies were to marry the son of a ruling class corporate family? What if, well, you'd have the Beverly Hillbillies all in the family, family ties, and Dharma and Greg, and the list could go on. But writers must write, and scholars must analyze. And we're now in the latest iteration of this question, is the sitcom dead? Last November, Neil Genslinger, a television critic for the New York Times, lamented the, its passing in that, that newspaper of record. He said, we've reached the end of comedy. If sitcoms are merely rehashing the same five categories of jokes, if they're just shuffling the same handfuls of situations, family with precocious kids, workplace full of kooks, the young and the hip being young and hip. And so here, at the end of comedy, there's nothing left to do but to embrace a recycling ethic, shuffle the various well-established pieces around, and hope someone chuckles. Have the odd couple guys babysit all in the family youngsters. Put Archie Bunker on a plane next to Corporal Klinger. No new shows need to be filmed. Just open up the archives and let people create their own. Mash up TV. Sounds like the future. Gensliger's comments are interesting, and so New York Times. But I prefer the perspective of the tabloid of record in New York, the Daily News, which considered the issue at about a quarter of the length of Gensliger's piece and concluded simply, the sitcom is just too funny to die. I suspect we will learn today that scripted comedies are alive and well and evolving right along with everything else, with new formats, novel situations, new and in the best cases funny reactions to our stresses, anxieties, fears, and hopes. In that vein, our first panel is called Why We Need Scripted Comedies. Its moderator is Howard Rosenberg, who was a Pulitzer Prize winning television critic for the Los Angeles Times and now teaches at USC. Howard will come up here in a few minutes and introduce the panel. But first, we'd like to begin by playing a classic clip from All in the Family to set the stage for the panel. Thank you. Okay, I think it, it falls to me to sort of introduce everybody. At my left is Jane, this is David, this is Phil who will be funny, this is Bambi, <laughs> <laughs> and Tom. We're all happy to be here. And, I, and I, let me say, just in the beginning, I, I realized we're on sort of dangerous ground here. I was telling Tom 
earlier that the fastest way to empty a room is to try to intellectualize comedy. Difficult it's thing true. to do. But uh, I, I hope we won't uh, really be doing that. Uh, well, you know, in, uh, I'm going to say a few words first because even though I'm moderator, it might be the last chance I have to talk. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in Woody Allen's uh, film, uh, Stardust Memories, uh, he is a filmmaker who gets very stressed when people try to uh, attribute great meaning uh, to his comedy films. When somebody asks him, uh, what were you trying to say in this picture? He says, I was just trying to be funny. And really, that uh, should be enough. I know it's enough uh, for me. Uh, I'm one of these people uh, who thinks the uh, sitcom is really when it's executed well, uh, a real work of art. Uh, to me, uh, you know, Seinfeld is as much a masterwork as the Sistine ceiling, for example. It's a slight hyperbole, but you, you, get, you get the idea of, of what I mean. Uh, I, I think there's, uh, you know, it, it's a great art uh, to make people uh, laugh. Uh, tonight we're going to be using the word sitcom a lot, but that's a very broad, uh, category under which there are lots of subcategories. Uh, there's a, you know family comedy, there's workplace comedy, uh, there are family sitcoms, there are extended family sitcoms, there are surrogate family sitcoms, uh, and on and on. There's something that people uh, now call a sitcom a verite, and we'll all we'll be talking about that in uh, uh, one way or another. Uh, I to me. Uh, the Sopranos uh, has been a watershed moment uh, in uh, television drama uh, because uh, it gave uh, credibility and uh, commercial success uh, to something that we now call a moral ambiguity, which really reflects uh, the complexity of all uh, human beings. And from that has flowed a lot of interesting shows all the way to Breaking Bad today. Uh, so I just want to ask uh, the panel, all of you, uh, has there been, or have there been shows like that uh, in the history of television comedy that have altered uh, the landscape? Yes, uh, yeah. right, right away. Altered the landscape and also uh, affected us as a culture. Uh, Raymond, we just saw All in the Family. Uh, I Love Lucy. Uh, Ellen might be one. I mean, would there have been a Will and Grace or the um, gay family on uh, modern family, if not for Ellen. So what do you think? Have there been any watershed moments like that? Let's go first. Now for my next I'll, question. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go first. I'll yeah. go first. Is this on? Can you all hear us? Yeah. Because it's interesting, Howard, you mentioned The Sopranos. We, uh, I did a series called American Primetime, which is, I think, mm -hmm. why I'm here. I'm a journalist. And Phil was one of the people we interviewed brilliantly. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also interviewed David Chase, who created The Sopranos. And the reason he agreed to do it is because we were looking at primetime scripted entertainment. And I talked to him about The Sopranos and, and told him that we thought there was a lot in common with, uh, with Jackie Gleason's show, The Honeymooners. And he said that he thought The Sopranos was really intended to be a comedy. And he set out for it to be a comedy. And when he, he said whenever we had a chance, we went for the joke. So I think The Sopranos is sort of did break the boundaries of what comedy can do on television. Um, and for me, that's a, and if you actually look at the show and you look at scenes from the show, you know, they, they actually are playing it for laughs. Like when his son tries to commit suicide, he's got a bag over his head. And they put that bag on his head because they thought it was funny that he had to go, the, if you're going to jump in a pool, you, the last thing you'd actually do is tie a bag over your head because there's air inside. So, and they just thought that was funny. So, I mean, I, I, I think... So he's a sick bastard. Exactly. <laughs> and therefore funny, Right. Uh, so I vote for yeah. The Sopranos. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, just jump in when you want to yeah. say something. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that the year 1970 was a watershed year for sitcoms, and that was the year where both the Mary Tyler Moore show and All in the Family, which you just saw a clip from, debuted. And at the time, everyone thought that All in the Family was the watershed show because it dealt directly with political and social issues, race, feminism, all kinds of uh, current topics. But in retrospect, I would say that the breakthrough show was the Mary Tyler Moore show because of the way that it filled out the workplace comedy and it, it has been so influential on subsequent workplace comedies that um, I think that it was probably 
um, the show that influenced other sitcoms the most? One of the things about, about The Sopranos uh, was that you know, sitcoms are often uh, uh, described in terms of uh, cookie cutters. You, know, you get something and you make a variation of it mm -hmm. because you know that it works. Mm -hmm. And so you have this uh, typical American uh, uh, family. Oh, I'm sorry. You're not on. <laughs> um, so, so you have this, this typical American family, uh, uh, just one, one little difference. Uh, they happen to uh, be in the business of murder and uh, yeah. uh, in the mob and so forth. And, th and then you have the next um, uh, HBO uh, variation of that, Big Love, another typical American middle class family in the suburbs. One little uh, difference, they're uh, polygamists, you know. And uh, how far can you take it? In a sense, the, the sitcom set up a, uh, a structure uh, for which these uh, uh, dramas uh, n now uh, uh, are uh, spun off in the sa same way. And it used to be thought that you know the sitcom was was the low form, but I think as Gilbert Seldes, who was the first TV critic, uh, uh, pointed out that uh, in in television, uh, comedy is the high form and tragedy is the low form. Uh, based on the fact that it's a series. A tragedy has to end with the death of the character. The death of the character means the show's over. You know. And so uh, uh, you have this uh, uh, re reversal of uh, artistic uh, uh, structures. Oh, I, I think that um, in a lot of ways, I go back to All in the Family, uh, when I think about teaching that, that particular episode, showing it to students mm -hmm. who have no you know, who I have to explain who Sammy Davis Jr. is. <laughs> um, and right. one of the things that just shocks them is, like, did he just say that? Did, it, and th these are kids who, who, students who grew up with South Park, who grew up with Chappelle Show, who grew up with a lot of, of uh, uh, sketch comedy or animated comedy that, that pushes boundaries even more than... Um, than you would expect. But I think that one of the things about All in the Family that's so amazing is it really does fit pretty soundly into the domestic comedy frame. And what the social sitcom does, what the, you know, that tandem juggernaut of, of good times and, and um, at one day at a time, Maud, All in the Family, what they did was take the framework of the situation comedy, of the domestic comedy, and then in infuse it with all of these social issues that were taking place at the time. A and so you, you get this hint of what you're, you're talking about in relationship to The Sopranos. You already get this hint of um, generic hybridity within the context of, of these shows, that, that there's pathos and there's, and there's comedy. And what the show that immediately comes m to mind to me is, is, is Louie, um, the, the FX show, um, where I, I feel like Louis C.K. is really pushing those boundaries even more. And, and interestingly enough, it, it's sort of it coming from a kind of staple form of comedy too, the, uh, of sitcom too, an act-based sitcom you know, where it's really generated from the act of the particular comedian. And um, I, I was just watching uh, the episode last night with uh, um, Greg Stanhope, um, uh, the comic, Dan Stanhope. Um, and it was really, it, it's, it was a really poignant episode, but there were, it was also a lot of really funny things in the context of that show. And I feel like, you know, I feel like I've heard the sitcom declared dead at every point mm -hmm. in my life. Like, it was dead before All in the Family. It was dead mm -hmm. again before the resurgence of the dom-com in the 1980s. It was dead again after MASH went off the, off the air. It was, you know, it's, it, but it's, <coughs> it's sort of like um, the cockroach of genres. <laughs> 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 it's going to survive all of us. And, and it's because there's this resilience to the desire of an audience to watch something on television that, 
makes you laugh, but that also resonates on some level with your own lived experience, or is so different from your own lived experience that you are, are getting a little bit of pleasure from um, the, the, you know, from the fact that you're not like the Bluths in Arrested Development. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm talking way too much, so I'll stop now. <laughs> well, David, I know this is something you've been thinking about a lot, about the durability of the genre. Is this sort of in sync with what Bambi said? Well, if one thing, um, uh, sitcom is probably the least imaginative um, uh, genre on television in terms of visu visual. Uh, there's almost no in innovation uh, visually. You get shows uh, that are filmed like MASH, which are different than shows that are uh, done in a studio like uh, All, All in the Family. Uh, but uh, when, when it comes down to it, uh, nothing new is, is happening. Well, that's a virtue, I think, for a lot of viewers uh, who are not interested in uh, being visually wowed by uh, television, but uh, instead are interested in what used to be called content. Uh, sitcom is people sitting in a living room watching people, for the most part, sitting in a living room. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, gee, is that me? Or uh, how much that is not me, you know, is something to be proud of or, you know, whatever take they have uh, on it. If art is uh, uh, imitation of life, uh, it sort of sets you up to enjoy it that way. You know, I'm not sure I agree with that because I think that <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me should never have turned his mic on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to me that the most recent development in sitcom has been visually innovative, and I'm talking about the line that goes from the British version of The Office. Has everyone seen that with yes. Ricky Gervais? Yeah. And then, of course, um, it was adapted to the American version of The Office using the identical script for the pilot, which I think is very interesting because it gives us uh, this fabulous opportunity to compare a Britcom to an American sitcom. You can really see the differences with the same script. But I think that this move uh, toward what some people have called sitcom verite, in other words, sitcoms influenced by cinema verite kinds of shooting. I do think that this has been a visual development um, in, in the history of sitcom. I think that the use of Steadicam, the use of single camera, the use of zoom lens, the use of confessionals derived from reality TV, all of those things have um, changed the sitcom, I think, so drastically that sometimes I wonder if we really want to call these newer shows sitcoms at all. You know, do we need another name for them? Scripted and, comedy? And, <laughs> and I'm talking, some of them aren't even that scripted. There's a lot of improvisation in them. Yeah. But um, well, I, well, I think they look very different from traditional three-camera sitcoms. Yeah, well, Curb Your Enthusiasm and Web Therapy, for yeah. example, are, the actors don't have scripts, they have outlines from which right. they work, and then they do improv. Phil, when you were uh, making uh, Raymond, were you thinking a lot about how the show looked, or were you just thinking about how it played in other ways? Uh, couldn't have cared less about how it looked. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, we were not trying to do something innovative. We were just trying to... to, to I, I told people the hook here is that we're trying to be half decent, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we... We came from the shows that came before us, On the Family being a great example. And, and if I can just refer to that clip for a second, because yeah. it, was, it was so fantastic, mm -hmm. I think. What we tried to emulate was when Edith says that line to Sammy Davis Jr., and then they cut to Archie while the laugh goes on, and he just holds that look at her. That reaction shot is everything I valued as a 10-year-old mm -hmm. watching that show. This, to me, was theater, great theater, an evening in the theater, that, and, and better than most plays on Broadway in terms of the writing and the acting, right, and the, and the craft. This is, this is what we were hopefully trying to emulate, that, that, that kind of deadpan comedy I saw it in The Honeymooners, 
It's uh, in Dick Van Dyke somewhat, and it was, it was in The Odd Couple. It was in Mary Tyler Moore. These were shows that uh, had a studio audience and were performed like plays. And we were just trying to have an evening in the theater at your house, right? That's what I liked. That's just what I liked. So that's what we were going for. And, and we found actors who could really do it. So that's all, that, and the visual style is, you know, it's still the couch, right, in the living room and the kitchen, and that was it. 90% of everything took place in those two rooms, right? But, but the key is really the writing. I mean, when you look at these things carefully over time, the difference between the ones that succeed and the ones that fail is how good the writing is. Um, because if you don't get that right, you've got no chance. And, you know, um, your show, Phil, I mean, you didn't care about the visuals, but you did care about the visuals. The, the set was meant to look a very certain way, like a Long Island home. Yes, but we cared about it in so much that it would not distract right. from the writing and the acting. And it that it served like the it writing the right and the place. acting. It had yes. to feel like the right place. But it, I guess every show cares about its surroundings and style serving the content. Any good show, I think. Yeah. Right. The mistake becomes when the style takes over, and yeah. that's all you have. And there is no content. And we're just cutting. But it we're always, just cutting. Start, always starts with the writing, right? Without the I writing, no matter so. how good the cast is. But that's right. rare. Sure Most things that, write this down. <laughs> <laughs> Most things are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> always been true. <laughs> that's true, though. That and when, so the, true. when the content is not important, when it's just style, when we're yeah. cutting to, from the bedroom, to the coffee shop, to the airport, to the uh, bathroom, right? <laughs> you have many things flashing in front of you in those 22 minutes. I call it the illusion of entertainment. Right. Right? You think at the end of the half hour you've been entertained, but you've really just seen a lot of stuff. I, actually, I felt, <laughs> I, I, I felt just the opposite many times. That I haven't been entertained one bit when I've seen yeah. uh, what, what, what you're talking about. Yes, because <laughs> you're smarter yeah. than everybody else. <laughs> yeah. But it's the notion that, that, that yeah. pace in and of is an end in itself, which it isn't. And it's the yes. myth of the short attention span, which I don't believe in at all. I think we're just much mm. more efficient at consuming information, and therefore we need to make things denser. But that doesn't mean that long scenes or you know, things that play out over a great period of time can't be very, very successful. And this, that's certainly true in comedy. Yeah. Well, we, we, want it to, we want it to be sucked in by what they're saying, by Archie having that very... Yeah tiny conversation with Sammy Davis Jr. Wow, this seems like a charged situation. I can't wait to see what happens next. Not because we're cutting around. Right. Because of the content of what they're saying and their characters, who they are. Well, let's talk a little bit about the characters. In your uh, archetype, uh, the man of the house, I think, I don't know whether you say this or somebody else does, uh, Phil, but, and, and you, because you mentioned uh, Jackie Gleason in The Honeymooners. My favorite. Where Raymond is, in a way, an extension of that character as seeing board as sort of the imposing male who appears to be imposing, but is essentially rather powerless. What did you did think Raymond was imposing? Well, he's, yeah. phys he's physically <laughs> imposing. He's, 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 physically, he's physically imposing. You are then what we would call a nebbish. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so his brother is even more physically imposing right. and even more powerless, okay? But it, is, but it is a genre of character. And also, I think maybe in the same archetype, uh, you, you have a clip of, from uh, Father Knows Best. Right. And with the mother is instructing her daughter, Betty, that the way to really uh, run a house, uh, to run the household, is to make the man think uh, her ideas are really his ideas. Uh, uh, contrast that, for example, the wife in Raymond. Different times, right? right. Who kicks, right. who really kicks some serious But As a matter of fact, I think we have a clip on that, right? We're seeing a uh, show now? Yeah, we're going to see a show. I have a, a terrible seat. You'll recognize <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> You're part of the show? <laughs> yes. Were we watching some kind of social commentary there, do you think? Oh, I, I think that it, it talks about gender politics. I think it's talking about how... how men and women are, are negotiating in a different way than they did uh, at the time of like um, 
Father Knows Best or the Donna Reed Show. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's really interesting. I, and I keep thinking about this in relationship to showing students um, different clips of things that they're not, have no experience with. You know, uh, with the Donna Reed Show, it's the Donna Reed Show, but Donna Stone is always subservient to Alex Stone and is always about, uh, you know, create, creating a way that Carl Betts is the most important person in the house, even when he's not in the house. And, and I think here, you, you have a different kind of negotiation between this, it, it, with, it, with this couple. And it does have the, you know, it does have a wonderful Ralph and Alice feel to it. Yeah, and 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 if you think back That's to a reference to the honeymooners, honeymooners by I'm the way. sorry, Ralph yeah. Cramden and his yeah. wife Alice. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in, in that, Alice always stood toe to toe to Ralph, right. e even when there was, you know, the the uh, supposed threat of to the moon, Alice. To the moon. Which shows you that in the '50s, that relationship did exist yeah. in real life. Mm -hmm. If it didn't, it wouldn't people wouldn't laugh. Right. They would say, "Who's that terrible woman?" So the Donna Reed show, Father Knows Best, and all the other shows, that was a choice to present mm -hmm. women that way, right. right? Absolutely. And our show, we're not trying to make any social commentary, honestly. We're just saying, and maybe this is just my experience, my point of view, but in my experience, I have found women better. <laughs> <laughs> we have to. Well, this sort of begs the eternal question, does the art shape the culture, or does the culture shape the art? I mean, what are we, what are we watching here? A reflection of the culture? A reflection of my house! Yeah, right. <laughs> right. I, I mean, if I may, w yeah. thank you for showing that clip from American Primetime, and you can see how good Phil was. He was the star, he was amazing. I did not enjoy seeing it that close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But what we found is that there's a difference between the intent and the result. And I think you can draw a very clear distinction between those things. The people who are writing comedy, as everyone has said already, are just trying to be funny, and they're just trying to show their house. But the result of that can be to create a collective conversation or stimulate or, or, or push ahead a collective conversation about things that are happening in the culture. So All in the Family ends up allowing people to engage around racism. You know, um, Phil's show, I think, points out very vividly the struggles that men have trying to manage multi-family relationships. Um, and that facilitates conversation, but it's not the intent, I think. I mean, I wonder if people agree with that. But I, like, I like that uh, I'm, here, I'm here with the writers of television, experts on television, who are telling you guys the interpretation of these things and what they mean culturally, because we didn't think of any of this. Right. Shit. <laughs> we, exactly. we honestly, well, like he says, all, we were all, trying all to... The, all the critic can say is, yeah. you know, all yeah. I'm saying is about what, what I saw. And of course. Uh, no, but no that's sense every... to anybody else, then I'm out of a job. No, or no, or I'm, a, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm saying I love this. <laughs> But how many writers do we have here today, or actors, or creative people? Um, because that's great, because you can't write a scene trying to be what these guys then interpret as culturally no. significant. You're dead if you do that. You have a very boring, but as, you know. But, but as a group, okay, uh, as a body of work, you can have a, a large cultural impact. Right? You can, but whether you, you can't Whether you set, intend it or you not. You can't set mm -hmm. out to. Is, that's what my only point. Right. I agree with that. Right? Yeah. yeah. You, you, have to, you have to write. Where, in our case, we, we, we literally wrote what we knew. I mean, All, yeah. all in the Family is, is a good example of that because uh, Archie was supposed to be the, the butt of jokes. Yes. But mm -hmm. uh, then there were bumper stickers all said, you know, uh, Archie Bunker for president. Yes. And, right. uh, you know, yes. in other words, uh, he, he was the voice for a lot of people that uh, would have given Norman Lear a heart attack. Yes, that was a backfire a little bit. Yeah. But, yeah. but I, would, I would say that the stuff that endures about mm. On the Family, the reason why it's still great to watch today is not because of the That's social right. content so much. There's only a few moments of the Sammy Davis thing that would endure and play today, the black and white relations. To me, what endures are the family relationships right. that still ring true. But wouldn't you, wouldn't you also no. agree that uh, what was current events then becomes uh, uh, like a, a, an artifact of history. Yes, but that's, you know. that, that, that's about as exciting then as an artifact of history. Right. <laughs> for, for me, there is no greater excitement. Yeah. 
<laughs> but you know, uh, if you take well, maybe uh, the most, <laughs> the most uh, vivid <laughs> example of the intersection of, of situation comedy yeah. and sort of current events was Murphy Brown getting pregnant and all yeah. that sort of thing. And we asked Diane English, who created that show, about that. And the reason they did it was really around c emphasizing Murphy Brown's character as someone who wants to get things done and who's all about business, and she felt her biological clock ticking. The impact of that was a cultural debate. D it was Dan Quayle didn't see it that Dan way. Dan Quayle <laughs> did not see it that way, exactly. It was on the cover of Time magazine, and Dan Quayle, who was vice president at the time, made a comment about it. So I think to Phil's point, you know, it's about writing characters, it's about being funny, it's about creating situations that have humanity in them, and then, you know, whatever happens, happens. But, but how about this question of the impact of the art on the culture? I mean, you know, I, I don't think that uh, married couples stopped sleeping in the same bed together when they saw Rob and Laura Petrie yeah. sleep in twin beds, but certainly there must be some kind of a greater influence, don't you think, over the years uh, the, of the thing? All in the family, did it have any kind of an impact on us beyond making us laugh for a while? Well... I think that um, All in the Family is an interesting case because there was actually a lot of audience research done on that show. And uh, I think that it certainly had a huge impact on white people in terms of um, just how radical the show was in its humor. I mean, the things that were allowed to be said on that show were, were very shocking and innovative. But unfortunately, um, as, as someone was just saying, um, it, it offended the black audience quite a bit. And it's very hard to, to show that program, even nowadays, to uh, African-American students because they just find Archie offensive. But um, it, as, as Phil said, there was a backfire <laughs> because Archie was popular and white working class men identified with Archie, and as soon as the character of Archie became likable, he, he could no longer be reviled as a racist, and so the social impact was in a way diminished. Um, and I think that this is um, an issue for all sitcoms, uh, the question of likability, because if you have a likable character, uh, you, you can't have him represent some kind of hated social stereotype, but if you have a totally reprehensible character, as they often do in British sitcoms. At the Office. Uh, yeah, and yeah. I mean, you can have, uh, the, the Britcom has always gone much, much further in truly repulsive <laughs> characters. But uh, if you have that, then will you lose the identification of the audience with the character? In other words, will the show be commercially successful? We got, we got that note. We got, yeah. They were telling me, oh, these characters, right. you know, some of them, they're, they're not likable. Right. So I could say to them, uh, can I ask you, who in your family is likable? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no one. <laughs> and and, and, and to, Ar to, to Archie and, and, and that show, I would say, they had, they tried to have their cake and eat it too. Yeah. In other words, we're going to make all these jokes about Polacks and blacks and Jews mm -hmm. and thing, and we're going to get all these laughs. And right. those laughs are because they're making these jokes, right, about these stereotypes. And at the end of the show, Archie wasn't right to say it, right? But you still got all the laughs. But I think so Norman Lear would, waves, but Phil Norman Lear would argue that he made Archie mm -hmm. likable on purpose, and that it didn't de decrease the social impact; it actually increased it because the audience could empathize with him, and they saw his humanity, and so his racism. Yes, and it's came also smarter because you, you just don't want a hateable racist. Right. That's yeah. easy. That's right. But, but right. he still got all the jokes. You know, all, all, all the family really. Uh, uh, Norman Lee has talked about this a, a lot. Mm -hmm. that, that wasn't a show in which he explored limits. Maud was the one in which yeah. he really tried to uh, uh, go to the edge. And, uh, you know, the, the lack of success in reruns is, uh, is clear. In fact, the few places that showed Maud in reruns uh, showed it as a late night program and, were forced to, and they were mm. forced to take the two-part abortion episode yeah, in which that. Maud has an abortion. Can you imagine trying to show that today on anything? Uh, and uh, that had to be taken out of the package. And uh, There was an abortion in the second episode of Girls. It was supposed to be. 
actually. Grey's Anatomy. And, and, yeah, so. well, Are you watching girls? Mm-hmm. Yeah. People? Does anyone watch that? Do you like it? No? No, Who said yes. No? Well, yes? yes. Who says yes? Raise hand. Who says no? Raise hand. One lady, one fella over there. Okay. Well, I'm just you, curious. Since, since you brought up girls, let, let's just go, return briefly to the point that Jane brought up earlier about, about uh, this uh, concept of cinema verite. I mean, I'm sitcom verite. And in, along with girls running right beside it is the new HBO comedy Veep which is yeah. very much uh, like what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. It at least it conveys the feeling of spontaneity even though it's scripted. Do you, think, do you think this is something that's going to increase this trend, expand in the future? Or is it just a blip on the landscape of comedy? Well, I think it's too big to be a blip. I mean, there are so many shows that are, enthusiasm is that are, you know, that are <laughs> either single camera or steady cam or that don't use laugh tracks or that are improvised. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty large group of shows, and I think that um, they do appeal to the younger audience. But I, um, I don't really like this development. I like the reaction shots that you got in traditional three-camera studio audience comedy. Um, And I think that, you know, if you look at that clip we saw from All in the Family, I mean, what was really great about that show were were Archie's extended reaction shots um, that went on and on. And and, uh, that was, that to me, really increased the laughs. And... Um, I personally don't think that camera wobble is all that artistic. Um, So, I mean, maybe it's just a personal prejudice, but um, I don't think that blending the sitcom with reality TV um, makes it funnier. Or maybe I'm just too old for these shows. But I think that... (laughs) That may be (laughs) Which is entirely possible. But um, I like the more traditional theatrical sitcom. And that's why um, I was telling some people last night that my very favorite sitcom that's on now is The Big Bang Theory. Because to me, that show is, uh, has everything that the best traditional sitcoms have. But You were going to say... I was going to say that I, I watched the two episodes of Girls with my 24-year-old yeah. daughter, who is sort of of that... I mean, she's, li- she's living at home now because she's, uh, she can't afford to live on her own. But she's She must have loved watching it with you. Yeah, yeah. particularly the sex scene. Yeah, wow. she did. She got very nervous. You could see her sitting there squirming. Never and, in life. Yes. Yeah. And particularly the scene where the parents... It o- the show opens with the parents taking the daughter to dinner and telling her that they're going to cut her off yeah. right now. Yeah. And so we had... That was very funny. In a, way that's sort of, in a way, that's sort of social commentary. I think... Uh, Bambi, Bambi, you have said that social commentary is always happening in sitcoms. I, I think. What do, you, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that peop- we are products of society. We live in a world that impacts who we are and how we see the world. And so that is going to be a part of our reading of a particular show. And on some level, a part of someone's writing of that show. I'm not saying that there's this overt... Um, attention to, you know, it's not a very special blossom, you know, (laughs) that's not what I'm saying. But but I do think that sometimes the absences that exist in in certain uh, certain shows, and this was one of the criticisms that that has come up about girls, is um, it's yet another whitewashed picture of New York City, Mm -hmm. um, which goes along with Friends, which goes along with um, how I Met Your Mother, um, that, that shows that, that really show a, a homogeneous, a, an entirely homogeneous world, which for folks there in their particular age group is less likely to be the case than it would have... Um, it, it, I think it's less likely that the folks on the... Uh, on how I Met Your Mother would be living in an entirely racially homogeneous world than um, the folks in France. I think there has been more of a shift in terms of interaction with 
in, in terms of the next, the next generation, the gen, the millennialists. Um, it, it, it seems to me that one of the things that's attractive about all of these shows is that the presentation of life in New York City after college has been an extension of life in a dorm. You know, it's like, like college goes on forever, don't worry about it, <laughs> just more fun coming up. <laughs> yeah. But, that, but that's comedy, that's not the case in the police procedural, right? Which is, shows New York in a very different light and hardly a homogeneous that, That's a whole light. other genre. Yeah. But it's still on television. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I, I, guess, I, I guess I think there are moments that, I, well, and I just thought of the fact that Wayne Brady gets played for a laugh so much of the time. <laughs> but in How I Met Your Mother, Wayne Brady plays, uh, do you guys know How I Met Your Mother? Have you ever seen the? Okay, she plays Barney, Neil Patrick Harris, brother. And so you have, um, you have a black character playing the, the brother of a white character, and oh, that's so funny. Um, <laughs> and, and, but but that, that's this sort of commentary about diversity. And, and someone in class, actually, a student said, no, 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 How I Met Your Brother has Wayne Brady. Um, and it just seems like, having Wayne Brady is, is, or having one character seems a lot like the integration um, process, the process that we've seen since I Spy. Integration do you think it was like a one. wise guy writer's response to a note that came down saying uh, there are no Could black be. characters in the show? Could Sounds be. like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what about working, we're talking about fans, what about working class families? What happened to depictions of working class families in sitcoms post The Honeymooners, for example. Bambi. They disappear um, How for could a that while. Be? How could that be? Uh, well, because they, I mean, and I think that we talk about The Honeymooners as <laughs> this incredible, <coughs> And, and I think it is this incredible example of like the kitchen sink comedy that that mm -hmm. that um, that that's driven so much by the individual personalities of the players and how they're written, how the characters are constructed. Um, but I think you you have this gap between the the you know the mid 1950s when the honeymooners go off the air until you. Oh, until you get to no, I would actually argue that the ghetto sitcoms, um, uh, like uh, like different what, strokes. Di no, um, I, oh, uh, uh, the one in good Chicago. Times. Good, yeah, good, good, times good times. Good times yeah. and um, good times. and what's <laughs> happening yeah. and that's my mama. Um, those were all examples of of working class black families, which had a whole other problem problems built into those. Um, uh, but it, but you also have. I think it's not until you you get to Roseanne in in the '80s that you have this real uh, resurgence mm -hmm. of what does a working class family look like? What are those struggles? You had that at the beginning of Good Times. You know, you had that at the beginning until they begin to elevate the the one liner dynamite into the central character, and, uh, and that, that... The word became a central character. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The word did yeah. become a you central character. You had to character. say it five times a show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah and, it, and it really... Um, and, and you have different players in the show leaving. Um, it, I mean, one of the big deals, and Esther Roll said this, who played the mom on Good Times, she wanted there to be a father, you know? They were th for them to show an African American nuclear family, and that was that was a really big deal when and when Good Times came on. Unfortunately, the family became secondary to JJ and the catchphrase, and you have basically John Amos leaving, who played the father, and then you have Esther Roll leaving, a in in a way that was absolutely unbelievable for that character. Um, and but it. You know, and the, I, I guess um, I broke the mic. Um, <laughs> I, I guess that one of the things that, that I find so interesting about, about the sort of absence of class is I think it, it, it's, um, it's something that, that happens frequently. 
that, that class, mm -hmm. that there's this sort of mythic middle, middle classness that is mm -hmm. pervasive, that is from the Huxtables to, uh, you know, to uh, Mike and Molly. Mm -hmm. the, and, the, the and you know, Bambi, I think that, um, that one of the things um, that was so remarkable about Roseanne was that it was one of the few shows mm -hmm. that had a white working class family which identified as working class. And, and uh, I think that most white Americans do not identify yeah. as working class, even if technically they are. I think that most white Americans I identify themselves as middle class. And I think that's why so the sitcom is so overwhelmingly a middle class phenomenon. Well, Phil, as somebody who is in the creative community as well as the producing community, what are the forces in the industry that dictate the kinds of trends that we're talking about? Uh, the overwhelming force is that they don't know what the hell they're doing. Okay. <laughs> they don't know what they want. They have no agenda that I can see other they, than yeah. cheap <laughs> and, and popular. They, they, they being whom? Identify they being they. whom? Yes, they. Uh, by name? No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> by... <laughs> by the You'll territory they occupy in the structure, yeah. Uh, the networks and then the studios, right? Because they cater to the networks. So they shotgun. They they read, they commission 100 scripts for pilot season, then they film 30 of those, and then two or three get on. The ones that test the best and the ones that, you know, seem to, you know, one, one network uh, guy a couple of years ago made the, the, the statement that he should have never said out loud but we know now it's at the bottom of everything. We're going to make money by saving money. Now they've said it all right there, <laughs> and that's all they care about. I, I, there's a particular network that has canceled certain animated shows and kept their cheapest one. Why? Because it's the cheapest one, not because it's better. Well, th this is a widespread economic theory now. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Universities, for example, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, it's not just television. Uh, That's right. It's not just television. It's everything. Yeah. The, uh, I was told, don't bother writing a screenplay for movies unless you're selling a toy. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or an amusement park or, or something that yeah. will make the real money. Yeah. The real yeah. money is in the other things. Yeah. Well, we want to thank our panel for their execution. Jane, David, <laughs> everybody. Thank and you so much. And now I eat. And thank um, you so much for coming me. today. I'd like to also just, um, I want to thank everybody in the audience for coming to the first thank session you, of, the, of the, uh, uh, the cockroach of genres. And, um, <laughs> but I'd also like uh, to thank Steve Lafferty, who came today and who is also part of the process Steve of putting Lafferty. this whole panel together. Thank you all for coming. We're back here at 1.30 for the second session, which is the writer's room. Thank you.